down with Charlie and I'm going to introduce you. I'm going to let Mary, I'm going to do a welcome. Mary Lou's going to do a welcome. Then I'm going to introduce you. Okay. And then we'll start. Okay. okay. And we're going to stay seated down front during your presentation and then come to the table. If y'all want to come on in, we're going to get started. What a great crowd. Thank y'all for coming out tonight. I am, with, I am Clara Cox, and I'm with the organization Georgia Women and those who stand with us. And we are one of the two sponsoring organizations for this event tonight. Um, our organization is a nonpartisan group here in Middle Georgia um, that works on issues um, that are important to women, including health care and uh, civil rights and um, voter access and registration. Um, I should have. I've got to get better at these five. <laughs> Public education and then uh, protection of the environment and the realization um, of climate change. And so those are some of the things we work on. We share a lot of common um, issues with uh, League of Women Voters and are grateful that they are uh, co-sponsors with us in this event tonight. Um, I'm looking for Mary Lou. <laughs> There you are, you're not even. And uh, Mary Lou's here to bring greetings on behalf of League of Women Voters. Good evening. I'm glad everybody is here. My name is Mary Lou Ezell and I'm with the League of Women Voters. If you are interested in knowing more about us, there is a book on the end of the refreshment table. Just put your name and your email address and we will get in touch with you and keep you informed about what we're doing. Obviously, we are a voter organization but more than that, we're really about community, education, advocacy for voting rights. And uh, the census is going to be a great way to start tonight and learning more about it. And I'm glad you're here. Thanks. And it's uh, my honor now to um, introduce our speaker for tonight and the one that knows the most about census in the middle Georgia area right now. Um, I'm fortunate to have gotten to know her through our um, common love of music and, and honored to call her friend and all the best things in my life come through the music world. But she has quite a, a um, mission of her own and um, history of, of service here in middle Georgia. Um, Jessica Walden works with mission-driven organizations to share their powerful and purposeful stories. She recently added the role of community partnership specialist for the 2020 census, charged with education, promotion, and the collaboration of local efforts to increase participation in hard-to-count populations throughout central Georgia. As a partnership specialist, she's encouraging communities to tell their stories through census data, so populations are barely represented in government and federal funding allocations. And we're gonna hear more about that tonight. Jessica is a lifelong Macon native who currently lives in Twiggs County and is working throughout central Georgia. And we are honored and welcome to have her here tonight. Thank you so much, Claire. Um, I'm excited we're doing this and I can't think of a better exercise in civic health than us all getting together and getting to know the census more because basically my role as the community partnership specialist is I've been charged to be a town crier and to say the census is coming, the census is coming and we have to be ready because we deserve to be counted. We count here in Bibb County, we count in Central Georgia, we count to the state and of course we count in our role with federal funding and so I'm going to take you through the basic presentation. Um, this is our education phase in, in, for the 2020 census. This is about each one teach one. We learn more about the census. We learn more about how we can organize, how we can do this from a grassroots level, how we can identify trusted voices within our community and collaborate these efforts so that we are completely counted and that we're able to meet the challenges um, that our community will face with the 2020 census. So um, we'll go through this presentation and then we will have a panel afterwards and uh, try to answer your questions. Okay, so one of the things um, that the census is doing is putting, when working from a grassroots level, putting the power in the people. And one of the first ways to start with that is with complete count committees. 
Now, a complete count committee has already been established here in Bibb County. Um, we've got co-chairs, uh, Janice Ross and Carol Payton are the co-chairs of the Bibb County CCC, as we call them. And our surrounding uh, communities, Houston County, Twiggs County, Crawford, and others are also, or have formed, their complete count committees. But that does not mean that you can't form a complete count committee on a local level. And I would say that the league and Georgia women have really stepped forward and said, we are also going to work on a committee level with a complete count committee and work with governmental and um, other partners so that we have complete count committees from the government all the way down to our churches, to our neighborhoods, to my own household, which is the complete count committee. It worked earlier. There we go. All right. So the census, let me just do a quick poll here. How many of you voted in the last election? Everybody in this room. And if not, we've got registration available. How many of you remember filling out the census 10 years ago? OK, there's a little hit and miss right there. Well, the idea of filling out the census every 10 years, the decennial census, isn't a new concept. It's been conducted every 10 years since 1790, as required by the US Constitution, Article 1, Section 2. Interesting fact, in 1790, 3.9 million inhabitants were counted. Notice, inhabitants. The um, census was originally con conducted by US Marshals. Um, who worked as enumerators on horseback for many of those years between 1790 and 1870. And then in 1880, enumerators were hired to specifically carry out the census. Another fun fact I've learned since working with the census is enumerations are still handled in Alaska on horseback to some of the more remote areas early in the year. I'm going to get it right, Rachel. There we go. So why we ask communities to give your time, your brain power, your volunteerism, um, and your resources to the 2020 census. I heard one of my counterparts say it best, money and power. The census is used for constitutionally mandated for reapportionment of Congress. Census results are used for redistricting at the national, state, and local levels. And then the economic impact of the census. Billions of dollars are distributed to the state and local governments using census numbers. The number that I have been told from the federal level, $675 billion are determined through census data. That goes from the top to how it's allocated to the state to how it's allocated here locally and make in Bibb County. When we have need, we need numbers. The resources are allocated based on numbers, not based on need. And that's something that has been very striking to me in working on this. Um, if you look at the 2010 census, Georgia actually gained a seat. Um, many did not see a change. Some lost a seat. And if you look at Alabama in the news right now, they're doing everything they can to promote the 2020 census because they're in danger of losing a seat. We're going to get this. Okay, thank you. So <laughs> it's sticky, y'all. <laughs> um, so census data is used in many ways, um, and it's ways that we uh, live our life every single day. It is used to forecast future transportation needs. It determines area, areas eligible for housing assistance and rehabilitation loans. It assists our governments in planning and implementing programs and services in education, healthcare, transportation, social services, emergency response, designing facilities for people with disabilities, elderly, and the children. And let's go even further on the children. Title I funding depends on census data. Pell grants depend on census data. So many parts of our lives and our children's lives, WIC, SNAP, all of these things are determined with census data. 
and Commissioner Lucas is here tonight and she sees these numbers and she sees where how the funding is attached to this all right Rachel I'll let you click it yep thank you um, so everybody here trusts the government right just saying we're in the government center well I am learning that this is one of our challenges is privacy and confidentiality. People want to know, is my data gonna be safe? The 2020 census is gonna be online this year. You would fill it out online. You are not getting the traditional paper form in the mail. You are actually getting a postcard that tells you that now's the time to go online and fill out the census. Now, that will not be your only option. You do have the option to call in your information and you have the opportunity to request a paper census form but the first step is going to be go online or try to go online so confidentiality is a concern um, but I can tell you that if you look at the sample census um, form these are questions that I could honestly Google anybody in here and I could find out exactly about Claire Cox if it asks you for your social security number, if it asks you for your debit card, if it asks you for your political party, that's not a US census. So that is something that, again, as trusted voices in our community, we have to get the word out that this is information that we can feel comfortable to give and this information is needed to give. And another big part of it is you don't want to give your information, you don't want to do the census, well, you're going to get a couple of reminders. And after those reminders, you're gonna have people knocking at your door. So my recommendation is, if you don't wanna get in trouble for not filling out your census, fill out your census, and you will not hear that knock, knock, knock at the end of the reminder phase. Um, confidentiality is taken so seriously that when I took on this role, I had to take a lifetime oath that if I saw anybody's census data in here, so if I said, did you know that Claire is this age? I would never do that to her, by the way. Because I saw her census form. Well, y'all could send me to jail. You could send me to jail up to five years and I could pay $250,000 in fines. And I love my hometown with all my heart, but I do not love y'all this much. So I can just tell you that they are very serious. It was a big precedent to know that, that that's part of this, is confidentiality is key to this. And of course, it is making sure that our neighbors, our family, our friends know that when they fill out the census, that they are taking part in the Constitution and that they are required to do so. And again, you don't want to knock at your door reminding you to do it. All right, Rachel, we'll go one more. So again, just reiterating, it's not going to ask you for a Social Security number. It's not going to ask for a money donation. It's not going to send requests on behalf of a political party, and it's never going to request pins, passwords, credit card, bank info. And I think that's something that us, we all know that, but we'd be surprised. It is very easy um, to confuse uh, a, an official census with somebody asking for more. So um, we do the census, the decennial census, every 10 years. But some of you in here, including myself, have gotten the community information survey. These are things that the census conducts year round, so we can use that data for many parts of our lives and information that we all use. Um, but uh, has anybody gotten a community information survey recently? Well, I got one for my business. And um, these are more in depth, asking more about employees and that sort of thing. But the Census Bureau is collecting data every single month. Go ahead. But 2020, that's what we want to leave here today. It comes down to this. We want everyone counted once, only once, and in the right place. If this was call and response, I'd say please repeat that with me. We want to count everybody once, only once, and in the right place. So um, to reach that goal, we've got the internet, we've got the phone, they're eliminating paper, but you still can request a paper form. And so I would say that's going to be part of the challenge for us this year. How do we communicate that? How do we have people opt in to taking the census instead of having the form being delivered right in front of your face? So as a community that I've worked on digital divide initiatives here, I know 
that 37% of us in our community don't have access to the internet. That's a challenge. So where do we have access to the internet? Where can we help people find a computer to fill out the census? Where can we um, support uh, a senior citizen who may not be digitally savvy? Um, and also reminding people that they can request a paper form, that they can go on the phone to do it. So the success of the 2020 census comes down to participation and it comes down to our trusted voices. So in addition to having our digital inclusion challenges, we've seen numbers for Bibb County that show that we have some of the lowest participation um, rates in the state for the census. So you got to think about that. For every person who doesn't participate in the census, we lose money. So every one of those responses is critically important to us. And I think Commissioner Lucas said it best the other night, if you vote, you do the census. I mean, they are yoked together in 2020. This is critical year in 2020, not only for elections and voter participation, but this is a chance to be counted and to have your voice heard. And these numbers, again, are what are gonna allocate resources to our community. So when somebody doesn't do the census, they're still going to use your roads, their children are still going to be in your schools, but you are not getting the funding from that person not being counted. We're at around 37% in our lowest response areas in Bibb County. Um, Rachel, go ahead. Our complete count committees are important to identify and leverage trusted voices. So again, you don't have to be a complete count committee just in government. You can be a complete count committee in your church. The AME Church has decided that every AME Church will be its own complete count committee throughout the state of Georgia. It's a huge effort and it's a fantastic um, uh, initiative that they're doing. Um, and Georgia women, I mean, they ran with this. That's why we're all here today because it's a complete count committee. The league is involved. These are some of the first people who stepped up and said, we will start these efforts early to educate. All right. So I would say it's not too late. We are still in education phase. And if you want to form a complete count committee so that you can organize and come up with a plan on how you will help increase census participation, I do have booklets right there. And I'm happy to help and meet with you in organizing and give you some ideas of best practices. One of another great local complete count committee that I worked with today is River Edge Behavioral Health. You got to think about the money to that they depend on coming from federal funding to serve people with intellectual disabilities, to help people with substance abuse, mental health. Today's World Mental Health Day. All of this came from census all the way down to block community block grants um, for housing. So they are doing their own social media campaign. They're putting information in prescription bags. I mean, they're coming up with their own unique plan so they can reach their audience. And, and it is, it is they're really great in doing so. So um, we'll skip through this. Rachel, this is about the structure. Um, let's get right there. Good job. So community-based CCCs. These are where we need people working the most. These are our hardest to count populations. Hidden or overcrowded housing. Populations that speak little to no or no English. We do have partnership specialists um, who I can call who can be here to help with translation. Um, in fact, he was here not that long ago. Uh, he's in Savannah. He had to evacuate, so he helped work over here for a little while. Um, Off-campus apartments, interesting enough, off-campus college students are one of the hardest to count when it comes down to census data. Think about it. Um, somebody's living off campus. They get the census form, but they still have mom and dad at home, and that's their permanent address. We have an opportunity here in Macon Bib with our increase in college students to make sure these students are counted. We want them counted here. We don't want mom and dad to count them at their communities back home. They are here, and it's about counting everybody once, only once, and in the right place. Um, of course, do you mind going back just a minute? And then uh, immigrant populations, high poverty areas. I'm going to show you a map resource in just a little bit. It's live online for any of us to look at on the census site. But you can actually click in our neighborhoods and see where some of the lowest census participation rates are found. And they are no secrets to us as high poverty areas. 
Um, I spoke to a group the other day, uh, and they're real estate agents. And I put it in this terms form. You see the business has left Presidential Parkway. Well, guess where some of our lowest census response data is, is around that area. So a lot of this is linked together. And then, of course, people displaced. Um, if we ended up gaining residents from one of our natural disasters, we need to make sure that they know they're counted here at that time. So this is just shows you a makeup. The Bibb County CCC has done a good job about having representation from each of these on here. Um, and then it goes down into subcommittees. So you can come up with a complete count committee and figure out how you could have a subcommittee to hit certain targets in our community. We'll go again. These are some great ideas in other communities that I hope we replicate. Um, the um, march to the mailbox to, to put in your census forms. Um, I hope that those signs on I-16 that says, you're going to wait a minute, is going to be switched over to say 2020 census is coming. Give us something else to read. Um, I've seen other uh, counties do um, a pie cooking contest because everybody wants a piece of the pie. This does not have to be slick marketing. This needs to look like us. This is a grassroots local effort, and that's what I really hope we see as we get closer to census time. So speaking of census time, here's the key dates. As I told you right now, we're really in the um, education phase. Some of you may have actually seen um, census workers out because they are doing the address canvassing operation. That means that they were verifying addresses, making sure that, like, let's say, um, one of our homes downtown that is subdivided into apartments, that they had an idea of how many addresses were in that home. It's also using satellite imagery, using um, resources of our partners like the Middle Georgia Regional Commission. And so all of that is preparing to send those postcards to the address because those postcards are attached to geography. Um, as we get closer through to census time, the call to action is March 2020. By mid-March, you should receive your card in the mail that says, time to go online, fill out the census. So this is when it is crunch time. April 1st is officially, April 1st, April Fool's Day, but don't let that fool you. It is census day. It is um, the day that I would say is the best uh, calendar reference that you should have your census done by then. Um, and if you don't, April 1 is the day to do it. So look at that as like our own Super Tuesday. Um, that is when there is basically a giant screenshot is taken of the community and we actually start seeing some of that early response, initial response information. And those will be live updated online. Then as we get into mid-April, that's when the follow-up is going to begin. So who hasn't followed up? They're getting reminders. And then by May, that's when the knocks on the doors will be deployed. I'm going to add to that. So because it is digital this year and because um, there is less paper, that doesn't mean there's less people. And one thing that I would say we could do right now as a call to action is let people know that the census is hiring. And I was on a national call today. We're actually behind on those hiring numbers. Without people powering this, I can't think of better people to go in our neighborhoods to remind people to do the census than those who live in our neighborhoods. So I would encourage you that if you know anybody who could do part-time work, especially in this time period, March, April, May, um, this is the time to apply. And you would simply go, there's a, there's a site here on the tablecloth, but you could also go to 2020census.gov slash jobs and apply. Um, October 22nd is National Recruiting Day, so there's going to be a huge nationwide effort to recruit people to work for census. And this could be anybody. Yes, enumerators are one of the jobs. So are clerks. So are field operators. This is great jobs for retirees. Um, you do get a voucher with this. So this is something that is a good uh, supplemental um, moment in time and, of course, taking part in history. This will last through August. Hopefully, I will be well out of a job by September 2020, and I can hopefully hang my head high. But um, that is when you'll start seeing the census offices close, and we will start thanking our community for participating in this and getting our numbers up. So Rachel will go forward. This is the map I was telling you about. This is called Rome. 
um, you can go all the way down to the very street. And it's super helpful because you can look at your street. And you can see what your response um, looks like in your census track. And then you can also see your resources and assets that maybe there's a child care center on your street. Maybe there's several churches that you could utilize. And the important part about that um, is that we know, we know where the hard to count areas are. So we really need to focus on that. So while it's great that our neighbors and friends, if you're not in a hard to count area, I would just say, what can we do to reach that hard to count area? Who, what are the, who are the trusted voices that you know? Claire's gonna mention an event in a little bit that'll hopefully be very targeted in that. Um, this is a helpful uh, tool, but going back to our numbers, this is where you'll see 37% non-participation rate in Bibb County. Um, this is where you will see that that participation rate actually dropped in 2010 from 2000. So our response has gone down. We'll skip through that, that's a replication. So education phase, then we get into awareness, January, February, you will start seeing census more and more on, the, on your TV, on the national ads. Um, motivation phase is where we have got to be ready to work and we are census is part of our culture just as much as it's important to vote and then the reminder phase and then hopefully the thank you phase um, and so this is what I just tell you this is about educating each one teach one I just can't recommend that enough I will have my card here I have a sign-up sheet over here if you can sign that if you want me to come speak to your group if you want me to show this presentation I am here to do that and I'm here to support try to get resources from the national level down to us so that we have what we need to educate people about the census. And I will come to your Bible study, I will come to your garden club, I will come wherever I need to be to help us think through some of the plans um, as we get closer and closer to 2020. All right, and we'll skip through this. This goes back and keep going. One more. Keep going. I'm not making y'all sit through the two-hour training. Okay, we'll stop right there. So here is another, um, the censussocialexplore.com. On this one, the lighter areas have a lower participation rate. You can see the light area in the middle of the state is us. And the county that they actually use to show um, a very low participation rate is where I live now, and that's Twiggs County. Um, the 2000 participation rate was 61% participate in the census. In 2010, only 52% participate in the census. So that means that 48% did not get counted. That's huge. And there, there is a dollar for dollar amount attached to that. And I'll leave it to the elected officials and those who've seen the data to actually say what that number is. All right, we will skip through the thank you. We will skip through activity. We've gone through the timeline. Um, I'm here to support you. We have presentations. We have flyers you can print. Um, Bibb County's Complete Count Committee has produced hand fans. They're here tonight. You can take as many hand fans as you need if you've got an uh, uh, opportunity to pass this out. It is October. We still need hand fans. Um, and we can also get these hand fans customized for your group. We have a local printer, a local vendor who's doing that at a reduced rate who can do any amount but if that's something that you want to do and you have the resources to allocate towards that, we can get some census fans going for you. And that's just a few of the areas. So we are preparing for 2020 census now. Um, this is more about the jobs. Um, I would say our library is also a local resource here. And if you need computer access, they can help you get to the job site. Y'all, it's the federal government. I'm not going to say it's a speedy process. I was one of the people who had to go through it. And I'm just going to say, be patient. But they need you. And the numbers are low, and the process is long. But this is about getting people who could do the job. And everybody don't, well, I don't know if I'll apply. I don't know if I'll, just apply. Just apply if you think this is something you want to do. Um, the other thing is we need people with computers, people with internet. Obviously, if it's ADA, accessible space. And we need people spreading the word about jobs. If you can host or be a recruiting, um, do some type of recruiting plan on this 22nd, I'm happy to work with you on that as well. 
and this is more about the jobs, including a job line. We'll hold it there for just a moment. 855-JOB-2020. We do have recruiters out, um, and, and we have many working in our area. But go, well, you got to get the process going online first. Okay. All right, so I would just say think about where we can get the word out on this census. Think about where we could put our plans in place. Hardest to count, I mentioned, were non-English speakers, new immigrants, new residents, college students. You know who else is one of the hardest to count? Birth to five-year-old children. We're not counting our children here. And I, if I just had to be a data analysis, which I'm not, but if I had to guess where we may have missed the mark in our complete counts in Bibb County, I would say it came down to our children. And that's pretty sad when we think about that we haven't properly counted our children. Why is that? You gotta think about if a grandparent has a child temporarily when census time came around, or if um, there's a joint custody situation, or maybe you don't trust the fact that you can put everybody who lives in your house because you're only supposed to have so many people living at your house at the time. That's the part of the stigma we've gotta get people to overcome. We've got to let them know we need an honest um, and complete count. And we certainly need to be counting our children in this. I've got information on that as well, and there is gonna be um, some national curriculum that will hopefully be in our area so that our kids can learn about the census, census civics. Hopefully they'll go home and teach their parents that they need to be counted as well. All right, this is the Atlanta office, but I'm your local contact. Um, I will have my card here. I would also just say, if you get on my sign-up sheet, I am happy to follow up with you. Um, we've got amazing partners with the League of Women Voters and Georgia Women and those who stand with us and our Bibb County um, Complete Count Committee as well as our AME churches. All these organizations are off and running and I would say if there's a way that I can support and help you get off and running with your own census plan, um, that's what I'm here for. And I think at this point we're going to turn it over to uh, Q&A and see if we can answer any questions. And I also failed to say at the beginning, I want to thank uh, the Delta Sigma Theta sorority for being here yes. doing voter registration. Another complete, Another complete count committee, too. So thank you, and forgive me for missing that in the beginning. Um, but at this point, yes, we've got some questions. And as, as we're asking questions and talking, um, keep writing. Keep thinking about what comes to mind. Um, and I'm going to read these calls to you. <laughs> Well, I'll do my math. Oh no, I'm having trouble with writing. I'm going to go with one I can read quick. Um, why the low turnout? Um, gosh, I'm having trouble reading. Okay. I don't know if there is a. So the, the question was why was there a low turnout in Bibb County in 2010 compared to 2000? I don't have an answer for that. Um, I did notice, because I am working in other counties in Central Georgia, Central Georgia altogether had a drop in participation rate. So um, as we go online, I don't know what that's going to mean as well. And I would just say it's part of the challenges that we really do um, need to make sure that since this is part of our culture from here through April. And this question has to do with overcounting and maybe being counted twice. Uh, this person had turned in their form last year and had somebody come to the door and felt like they had been counted twice by doing that. So can you address how, how we keep from it having or, or causing us to have that one person count every person once and in the right place? Right. So that's the goal. Um, and it's also the Census Bureau's job to make sure that there aren't any duplicates. So to me... I'd rather make sure we are counted and that that information. So let's just say if that child is at um, grandma's house and she counts her grandson and then mom counts her son, well, he's been counted. There may be a duplicate and that could flag a question. Um, but again, that child's been counted. So I would just say it's, um, it's good that there is a way to have that checks and balances on deleting duplicates, 
but um, being as accurate as possible with your census information is going to prevent the knocks on the door. So th this question asks, how do you guard against someone calling in and giving someone else's name and data? That would be a great question for somebody <laughs> higher up than me. I One of the reasons we did these cards is because if Jessica didn't have the answers to all of them, she's going to take them with her and find out the answers. To them. I'm going to ask somebody, has anybody worked for Census before and maybe knows the answer to this? I know there's been previous partnership specialists in the community, but that is something I, I just, again, I'm, I'm here to make sure everybody's counted once, only once, and in the right place. But I just don't have that answer yet. That's a great question. We'll save that one. And I'm going to kind of mul um, not change this one a little bit, but it asks, since you don't ask Social Security number, and et cetera, how do you verify information over the phone? Can you talk a little bit more maybe about what information is on the um, questionnaire? So the information would be um, who is living in your household and then a breakdown of that demographic profile. Um, it could ask, I believe it asks for occupation. It does ask for um, an income range. These are basic, um, uh, there's no personal information that couldn't be widely shared. Now, the data is so protected and the answers that you give that it's not released until 74 years after this census. So I hate to tell some of us here, but we're going to be gone. Um, and that's why right now at this point, you could go to your local library and start seeing census data, um, the actual data, like who lived in the house, how old were they, what was their demographic, what did they do for a living. Um, all of that's available for like the late 1940s right now. Um, and and. Um, some people who don't have a birth to have, have a home birth, there is some, you work with the Census Bureau to verify that through previous data, but that's how locked down this data is. Now, we'll know our numbers, but we won't know the specifics of how you fill out the census. So the data is like your name, how many people in your household, um, I think there's, is there 10 questions? There's 10 questions. And, and I, a couple of them, I think they were talking about are, are you sure that the answer you gave to this other? So there's really like <laughs> eight questions. I was questions. trying to remember, like there was <laughs> the one that, yes. And, and again, you can look at it online. You can just, if you search 2020 census form or sample form or go to 2020census.gov, you can see, um, you can see the questions. Mary Lou, you ask a couple. Yeah, I think, I don't know if this works. It's, ah, it does work. Okay. Please address the issue of undocumented workers. Now, undocumented workers are, uh, now if, if they are on U.S. soil, they are to be counted. It's that simple. Our goal is to count everybody once, only once and in the right place. They're not, the undocumented. This doesn't count citizens. This correct. counts people living in the country. Right, because they're still using our roads and our, they could have children in our schools and there's funding that that needs to be allocated towards that so okay everybody who's a resident and i would say that that's why we have to leverage trusted voices um and that's why we have spanish-speaking resources and uh and, and other languages in fact to to make sure people are counted and if you are undocumented you need to fill out the census if you don't want to knock on your door, fill out the census. All right, the second part to that was, how can we identify census workers when they come to the door? It's a great question. Um, there is official census credentials. I have a badge. Um, they, the enumerators will have a badge. They will have specific devices. You have every right in the world to ask for credentials. And if you have any concerns in the world, if they ask a question that doesn't feel right, please call your local law enforcement and report that person. Is there a penalty for not responding to the census? Well, again, it's in the U.S. Constitution, Article 1, Section 2. And if you dig deeper in that, you can read more up on the law. Um, I don't feel as comfortable just writing, like saying what the penalties are. There's been different versions of it. I'm not a lawyer, but you are supposed to do it. And technically you could be fined. 
Is there any local effort to counteract the negative publicity caused by the U.S. Secretary of Commerce's effort to put a citizenship question on the census form? I will leave that to you two ladies. <laughs> oh. I mean, the question was, is there any local effort? Well, I mean, I think we know that that was decided that it can't be on there. And so um, we as a group um, advocated against that happening and did work on that, but we feel that that was successful. So I don't know if there's any more local effort on that except trying to make sure that we get a complete count of all communities. Yeah. And there's... there's um, trusted voices in that community press that is you know in in, in the middle georgia area the um spanish-speaking community is our largest immigrant community and there are voices in that community trying to get that information out is, is that answering your question i'm not sure or, yeah it won't be on the it form. will not be on the form yeah, it is not, not on the form yeah. Right. That's a good point, though. There may be people who don't know that. There may be st people that still don't know that. They don't want to yeah. answer it. And they don't know it's not on the form. Yeah, I get it. Yeah. Um, one power, you know, I'm a, a tour guide on this side. I give music history tours, and um, I'm a, made a living off of telling our stories. And I can't think of anything more powerful than being able to look back through census data and to tell our stories. And when I think about somebody who is new to our country and um, they fill out the census, 74 years from now, somebody's going to look back and see where their story began in this country. And it's a really powerful opportunity to do that. And so, again, leveraging trusted voices. So outside of the funding, outside of, of congressional redistricting, I have to just remind us it's, it's about being heard and um, a fellow community partnership specialist told me that there was at one point a president of the United States who had to be moved from the White House due to renovations and Secret Service wanted to know the census data of the neighborhood in which he would be temporarily located and they couldn't get it. So if somebody knows the president, please tell me who Truman, thank you. Well, so, um, well, there you go. And so the, um, I keep telling that story and I don't ever have a chance to look it up. So thank you for verifying. And that. Leslie was saying that the president was Truman and he only had to move across the street to Blair's house. Is that, yeah. Um, this relates to what is on that mailed card when it comes. Will you get a user ID or PIN number or what will come so that you can access then the online census? So the postcard is called an invitation to participate in the census. So um, these will not roll out all at one time because if they do, there's a chance that too many people would go online at once and we could have a problem with the technology. I will say um, this has been beta tested in um, surrounding communities, including Savannah. It went well. Believe it or not, seniors were still the best participants in the census. They came with people saying, help me fill this out, help me go online, show me what to do. They made sure it was done. Guess who the lowest participation um, was in the, in the group? Millennials. The ones who can, you know, wink and make their phone do this. So, um, the card will arrive. It is attached to your geography. So that card knows to go to that address because that address is a residence. They don't know who is in that residence, but that's why the card is coming to you. Um, this card may have a geo code on there that allows you to get online and start filling out your form. Um, you may get another card that just says go to census.gov. It's time to start filling out your census. Um, this, uh, if you don't get a card, you need to go online and fill out the census. And that's, that's again, another challenge. Um, Claire and I have discussed this at length, too. Um, there is going to be a wide effort. Transient population um, and homeless. There are efforts where specially trained numerators will be working with our homeless populations, um, working with trusted voices, working with organizations like Daybreak. They will be going into homeless camps, making sure people are counted in, in a way that, um, that 
is, is specially trained to do just that. Um, yeah, and related to that, speak about like dorms at Thank colleges. Thank you, that's exactly where yes. I was going. Yes. The other piece of that is um, complete quarter counts. And so our jails, um, certain nursing homes, rehabilitation centers, hospitals, hotels, there are um, those uh, in on campus, those will submit numbers. So they will be giving like a, a count um, per the residents they know are living there. So some of that is being done. That is actually being done um, around March as well. You'll start getting information on that in January because that effort is a huge undertaking as well for organizations. So you're going to get the card and it's going to say go online. And so again, like it's important once you see that card, you'll know, all right, it's started. And did you get your card? Did you get your, you know, so that, that's a big part of it. And again, it's unique for this year. This is and, and those dates for the cards are going to roll out, like everybody won't have access and crash the system on the same day. That, that'll be a staggered date that you can go online and, and access and do. Well, it'd be nice if he was here on spring break and we could count him. Um, but if he's, if he's in the dorm, he will already be counted. So. And the idea is that everyone is counted where they are on April 1st. Wherever you are is where you should be counted. And, and we've, we've had some um, uh, events the last couple of days. And I mean, y'all, just if somebody is breathing in your home when you do the census, please count them. That, that's really what it comes down to. Um, please count. So some, most nursing homes will be providing a complete count through their quarters. Yep. That's the word I always forget is quarters count. Yep, the quarters so if you're, count. if you're living in places together like that, they're, they're, uh, the, those entities turn in a count called a quarters count. I guess we can go ahead and declare, um, you know, our local jail a complete count committee all in itself. Like they are going to be counted 100%. So, and I'm not sure if you know the answer to this one yet. Okay. Why can we allow or why not allow is how this is written schools to set up computers for parents to fill out online forms. I was not aware we didn't allow that. So you think um, we can allow that? I'm hoping that we look at our community from the Bibb County School District to right here where we're sitting. And if we can get the computers out anywhere for people to go online and fill out the census, we do that. Um, if you've got resources with computers that in your church, it, that, that's how this is going to get done. And it's going to get done the quickest way. And that's one of the things Georgia Women's going to be looking at doing is their places on, that we can set up computer banks or whatever. And we're just still waiting on the information of how that will work and how, how they're kept safe with the data and everything related to right. that. Right. So, and there's, I mean, this is new. This is a history making census. There's just some things we, we don't know until we get closer to the date on how technology is going to work for us. But we got to start making sure we know we're asset mapping our resources now. The libraries are huge, huge partners in this, and they have been extremely active. Um, and I would think that, I mean, already from, you know, applying from jobs, um, that they're going to be, when in doubt, point to the library, because they will have staff on site who can actually help somebody. This is how you do it. How um, are deployed military counted? They are counted through the military. Military has its own system um, that is. Where are they counted, though? They, it is, I believe it, and I don't know this completely, but I'm understanding is they are, um, they are counted according to what base they were deployed from. So it, it's, that is one. Um, now we, Robbins will be making an effort to do a complete quarters count for those who are um, living on base. Houston County wants to make sure they are counted. That is census day. So that's more of a reference date. So when you get the card, if you get the card on March 23rd and you want to go ahead and go online and fill out the census, do it. And that is about when you fill it out, 
who is in your home at that moment? Well, and that's that's where the bureau has to identify duplicates. So that we gotta we gotta make sure that they are able to count who's in your home at that time. You know, I, that's a down into the operation piece. I don't I don't have that answer. But we've got to make sure everybody's counted once, yeah. only once, and in the right place. That, That's the goal. That was the question I asked. I don't know if he's your <laughs> boss, but whatever. The other, the man that trained here first and asked him, he said, we have ways. And I was like, okay. Count, <laughs> yeah. count who is in your home on the day you fill out the census. That is so important. If there is that relative who just won't go away and they're sleeping on your couch, please count them when you fill out the census. We're going to claim them that day. Yeah. Are there any other questions? I do, okay, yes. Uh, if civics was put back into the school curriculum, do you think that would improve increased voting rates as well as census participation? Because it seems, you talked about millennials. Yeah. It seems that these folks don't know what their duties and responsibilities and all of that stuff is. Yeah. Well, if, yeah. Yeah. He asked, and I'm going to let Mary Lou answer it first, um, but he asked if civics were put back in schools, uh, would we have better voter turnout and, and, and students understand better, younger people understand better what their civic responsibilities are? Is that a fair? Okay. Well, and I can only share one piece of it. Since the League of Women Voters does go around and we register students in the high school every year, and every year it is very clear they don't understand at all and it, it's very sad and you know we say you're registering to vote huh what so it isn't being taught it isn't I don't know what's happening my teachers history teachers taught it it seemed like everybody knew when I was in school that's not the case any longer if they get it they get it from their parents but it doesn't yeah, there's seem a to be. Yeah, there's a statistic that's yeah. a very accurate statistic that children or young people that grow up voting with their parents are 80% more likely to vote uh, when they are grown and on their own. So. Yeah. Well, and going back to census civics, um, I did mm -hmm. learn from the national call that there is going to be a curriculum that is going to be available to our local schools. And it's everything from pre-K with a book um, about the census up to actual, you know, uh, mock participations and different modules um, and I just I'm the mother of a five-year-old and I can't think of a better teacher for me than him so when I go back to the hardest account being that birth to five um, when a child comes home and is is teaching their parent about the importance of the census or at least coming home with saying like this is I learned about this today it's a really powerful uh, communication tool so I'm hoping that our local school system will be able to get this early and get it often into our classrooms as well as all of our local private schools will have it available to them as well. And the local school system is sitting in on this complete count committee and are working to, to do just that. So, you know. Okay. Yes, Sam. And I, it, yeah, yeah, I mean, and, yeah. and I had girls that grew yeah. up in the public school system here, and it's being taught in, in two different grades as they come through at different levels. So I, I agree, and thank and you we for have, that. Thank you. Yeah, and there's a civics coordinator in the Bibb County school system, too, that is, um, we've got great partners like Community Partnership, who is already on it with the census, and that was one of the first people she said that she wanted to reach out to. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? So, yes, Elaine. That's a great idea. I would love to see that happen. I'm now the mother of a Cub Scout, so um, I better I better introduce that very quickly. Um, but that's a great idea, and that is it's identifying these groups that we can say like this is important, and you know maybe another den leader can take that on to to introduce the census. But that's exactly how we need to be thinking. 
I'm going to um, conclude um, with a couple of things. Jessica talked about and the importance of this is money and power. And the power has to do with representation and how our districts are going to be um, um, drawn in the future. And that's important. Um, there was in the paper um, the number of what this um, brings to local Bibb County. Um, I believe it was 13. I'm terrible at remembering numbers, and I don't have it in front of me, but it was in the 1300s multiplied by 10 is 13,400 ish per person per year. But at the state level, in a study done by George Washington University, the state here of Georgia receives 6,500 per person per year. So for each person not counted, that's $65,000 that our state goes without. So the importance of this cannot be overstressed. Going back to the mechanics, so that's why geographies, so how do we know it's 30, if they don't respond, how do we know that it's 30, 37 percent? And that's through the geography. So the geography surveyed ahead of time. So residences are identified, but then you know if the residents didn't respond. So that's how that math is done. Yes. Yeah, yes, Elaine, if you've got anything, not to put you on the spot, but I she's would, asking, yeah, if you've got any other information about Bibb Bib County or a comment on that. Sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> Uh, if we don't have a complete count. We really don't have the, um, a hard and fast figure as to how much we lost by not counting everybody before. We just know that it was an awful lot of money. And I, I think the reason that there's such a focus now is because there have been some people who've made such an issue out of trying to keep some people from being counted. And so you've had to have some people to redouble their efforts in making sure that there is a complete count. The last census, they did not allocate as much uh, money nor resources toward the census. We were at a national uh, conference and they were talking about the, the census. I don't think those kinds of things were done uh, before. Uh, communities know they're losing out. They have, they have realized that they lost out on so many resources for their, their citizens, and they don't want to tax their citizens when there is a source of funding that they're missing out on. So um, there's been so many, the national political, uh, the national organizations that are made up of elected officials, they've come out strongly in support of complete counts. Uh, the federal government um, has an office that, ha that is handling this, and they said they're going to hire a half million people across this country to do this complete count. So, I mean, they're serious about it. And there was one guy <laughs> who was there, and he was with the federal government. And people thought he was going to be scared to say. He said, well, you know, there's some people who have discouraged folks from participating in this. But we who work this thing are going to make sure that it does indeed work and that indeed we do count everybody. Atlanta has set aside a million dollars. Mayor Bottoms has, appropriate, has asked that a million dollars be appropriated for having a complete count in that area. Now, of course, Bibb County, I don't, I don't think I need to ask for a million dollars uh, here. But we do have an office set up up here 
that Jessica uses and anybody else can use. And we do have a lot of resources that are being put in place. We do have a complete counts committee, the larger one. The mayor serves on the state complete counts committee. So, and everybody in here is a complete counts committee. So I think we're well on our way and I think we're gonna have a much better, much better count. But as far as what the total figure that we would lose, I don't know what that figure is but it's frightening to think about losing what's already been uh, mentioned in here. So I'm ready to go to work everywhere I go. I'm talking census. My sorority is here tonight and they're talking census. Um, everybody, everywhere I go, they're talking census and that's what we've got to do. Well, I want to add something too, since Elaine Lucas is here this evening, she is going to be our speaker next Wednesday night at Historic Making Foundation at 6 o'clock. She's going to be talking about education in Bibb County. So I invite all of you to join us for that. It's a wine and cheese event. And if we're moving on to events, I'm going to end this unless something else. No, so if somebody else has got some of this, this is what I was going to say, too, because Jessica um, alluded to it earlier. Um, the next event that Georgia Women has related to the census is an uh, open for the whole community. It's a um, part of our tradition of Georgia Women to have signing events once a month where we write our elected officials about issues we care about on November 5th. Um, at Old Mulgee Brew Pub, open to everyone in the community, and we're going to be advertising it broadly um, at 4.30 to 6.30 that night. We're going to do a very selected um, postcard writing campaign to some of these um, underreported areas, individual handwritten postcards to those households to let them know what's coming and uh, to assure them that this is a community and the importance to the community. So I hope you'll come out and join us um, at Old Moggy Brew Pub on uh, November 5th at 4.30. So. What I was talking about? That's my husband who doesn't listen to me. Uh, that <laughs> is League of Women Voters next Wednesday night at 6 o'clock at the Historic Macon Foundation, downtown Poplar Street. And with that, I think we'll conclude unless we're cutting anybody off. And thank you for coming out. We are honored to have had this tonight, and thank you for your participation. If you want to just, just take them all, all it might be good just to the keep them all. The military one, I don't fully understand yet either. Thank you.